Today's company presentations are brought to you by Red Cloud Financial Services and the team at Red Cloud Vancouver. Red Cloud Financial Services is your preeminent source for mining industry opportunities. The team provides a unique tailored marketing program dedicated to reaching the right people from its mining-focused global network, giving clients access to industry-leading events and conferences, retail and institutional marketing, plus an in-house growth-driven digital agency. Red Cloud Financial Services has access to some of the mining industry's most notable companies and CEOs. Tune in every Thursday at 4.15 p.m. Eastern, 1.15 p.m. Pacific for weekly corporate presentations. For more information, Good morning. Happy Good morning. Sunday. special edition of Digging Deeper with John Lee, who is the executive chairman and interim CEO over at Flying Nickel. Uh, we've got a, a very uh, interesting news release that I wanted to catch up on, but also just kind of want to highlight, I mean, the, the desperate need we have for nickel. Uh, we see even just in Stevensville here where the uh, the German chancellor is over talking about hydrogen, but they're also talking specifically about critical metals as well. Uh, on that list is vanadium and, of course, uh, nickel. So looking for nickel projects that have a low carbon footprint that are a short term to market. I mean, all these things are critical. I don't want to steal any thunder, but John, <laughs> do, you to, do you want to start off with maybe kind of walking us through Monago again, just a little bit to kind of highlight that. And then we'll talk about what, uh, what uh, the latest news was as well. Yeah, I think, uh, Andrew, uh, there's <laughs> yeah, there's all the cover. I just get off another interview. And yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk on a Sunday morning, given your show is a Thursday special. Um, you know, I rather so given the deal, given the news on the vanadium potential vanadium transaction is at a later of agreement stage that we focus on nickel because uh, we had come on your program in the past. I really, yes. really, really want to endeavor to provide you with a wholesome update on the on the nickel front. Are you all right, uh, Andrew? There's a lot of uh, whole starting to kind of get a little bit of buzz on nickel in Canada. Typically, Canada, given that it's because it's a very fortunate and well endowed with hydropower. And uh, there's really not a need for batteries and, and renewables. However, and that's why the nickel juniors and the nickel mar nickel sort of mining companies play to a laggard in share price performance in on the TSX versus say on the in Australia or in the US. But the, nonetheless, you are seeing the government of Canada taking very proactive stance in promoting in, in and in financing nickel projects. Uh, not only as you mentioned earlier, but we are witnessing uh, the very uh, strong support from the provincial government of Manitoba. And there's also noise from Elon Musk uh, talking about creating a gigafactory there in Ontario. Yes. So there's a lot of uh, momentum uh, picking up in nickel. And, and uh, I, I think it's going to gonna bode quite well for investors who are sort of getting into nickel at this ground level. Yeah, because off, I mean, people, you know, they kind of learn it the first way. They go, okay, let's look at lithium. Or that's kind of, that took years for people to kind of get their head wrapped oh around that. Oh my God, that. yeah, a lot of but pain I, and suffering. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, it really took years before people, but that initial impetus. Now, I think people are starting to realize, wait a second, what are these other components? What are the other things we need? And where are we getting them from? And I think the large line share is Indonesia, is it not for, for nickel? But your nickel, though, uh, as far as carbon footprint, as far as grade, purity, very, very nice. Yes. In the lithium, is uh, there's a lot of lithium out there. It's a matter of the bottleneck. Uh, we have a pro sister project in Bolivia exploring for silver, but it's sitting next to 220 kilometers from Uyuni Salt Lake, which is the largest lithium reserve. And that is, thing is massive, Uyuni. Um, Elon Musk rightly talked about their batteries, not lithium batteries, their nickel batteries. Yes. Um, the technology has really sort of uh, been, been matured and everybody is standardized on the high performance battery being made out of MNC11, of which the cathode is 80% battery, uh, nickel, and 10% and cobalt and 10% manganese, where lithium is that energy storage of energy and the medium of energy storage. But you talk about the cathode. Um, you also mentioned, Andrew, that uh, there's nickel in, in, in nickel sulfide and in nickel, in nickel laterite. Um, Elon has been very busy making deals. He uh, made a major, he has a major offtake agreement with Valet, which is the world's largest uh, nickel producer. Yep. And he also has a stake in Madagascar nickel, 
um, Nikola Madagascar with Goro that used to be owned by Valet. It's now a Trafigora, um, a Japanese consortium. And he also just struck a deal with Indonesia uh, for the nickel coming uh, for the nickel coming out of Indonesia. The big differentiator, Andrew, I see the la difference between ladder and sulfide production, and it's getting more and more people are getting more and more aware and educated on it. Is that a mine like Minago, where it's a nickel sulfide and it's hydropower by in Manitoba, is the carbon intensity of the carbon emission per unit of nickel produced is up to ninety nine percent less than the nickel produced in Indonesia. That's that's huge. That's slide 10, if we can pull that up. That, it's I mean, tells the story. Yeah, and that the tells reason a is, story. The reason is, the reason is uh, that the power in Indonesia comes from coal fire power plants versus hydro in Manitoba. And then secondly, it's more important, is the method which the nickels are getting extracted in for ladder, right, of which they call the HPAL. It's high pressured acid leaching. So for the layman, that means you have to pressure apply 50 times the pressure in a highly you know, volatile container, apply maximum acid and heating it up to upwards of maximum 300 or up to 1,000 degrees to separate that difficult nickel ore, nickel from the, that difficult laterite ore. Whereas for us, we're, high, we're hydrometallurgical, we produce high nickel concentrate up to 30% without, without, without heating and without any application of acid. And then from the environmental side, not only is the carbon emissions an issue, but uh, Indonesia there have to resort to handle this highly delicate, just to, to, to put a mildly tailings and then dumping that into the ocean. Yes. That is going to be very problematic. It's being raised. The awareness is well reached. Um, and I think it's a matter of, matter of time before the plug is pulled. And uh, that's why already at, so days after Elam struck a deal with the Indonesia government, I'm not sure what the binding nature of that is, you have a lot of environmental conservationists already uh, making lodging formal complaints to Elon. I think what happened will be, Andrew, that Elon is not a stupid man. He is going to swap. And I, as I had a conversation with a couple of other uh, Elon uh, fans are gathering, garnering 100,000 views, that Elon, I think, is going to swap his dirty nickel <laughs> with clean nickel and pay yeah. a bit of premium He's still going to come ahead, right? Versus yes. the guys that don't have nickel or have to resort to the LMB paying hefty premium to secure that supply. So um, overall, well, if you're going to go for the second best, well, you have the opportunity to go with the best. Why not just go directly with the best, which is nickel coming out of Canada? Yeah, I mean, the, the pressure is going to be on. I mean, we already feel it now uh, with, the, with ESG, but especially with this carbon platform is if someone goes listen it's, this is in your next door neighbor it's close to your your projects you're thinking of building a gigafactory up in canada anyway why wouldn't you just go for one that hits all the check marks like and it's let's say i, I think there was a timeline it, it showed you're you're about two years off say now it's tough to keep sturdy timelines but this is a pretty short term well i think andrew let's go backwards so these pro these mining projects i mean Given the pace of what is going to 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 uh, to develop a, a nickel project or a mining project for that matter in in uh, United States or in North America, from the point of where the discovery is made to getting the first metals on the ground, it's going to take about a decade. Yes. Let me yeah. give a very concrete example. Fly Nickel acquired or this predecessor acquired this uh, Minago mining in February 2021. It took almost a year just to re-register. The title, yes, of the license, although she used to take a month, and now you talk about drilling the availability. If you lose, a, if you lose a drill bit, okay, and that's made in China, you're looking at a six months window. We have some rods like broken the, the rods for the for the for the yep. drill for the drill. It took like six months. It used to take it like a month and a half. Yeah. Um, let's go back to talk about ESG for a minute, Andrew, because this is a very fascinating subject of which even our company only just started to looking at the impact of that to our bottom line. ESG, which stands for environmental, social, and governance, it's not something just about feel good. I, be, I, I believe in the future, and all the major mining producers or producers already have to file their annual ESG report. And it's only a matter of time before even a junior will have to do that. Yeah. This is not just a feeling good or requirement. There is a material, tangible carrot and stick. And then the carrot being, if you look at Biden, has been talking about hundreds of billions of dollars 
or a lot of money being made available to subsidize nickel smelters, nickel mining, critical metals, infrastructure, and, and, and all this different subsidies. But it comes a lot of strings attached to it. Yeah. You cannot have any alliance with some of the countries they don't like. And I believe also that everything you buy, not only just the car, but even the mining and all the specific ingredients, will have what I call the nutritional table. So that would include you know, how much units of carbon you, you, you produce and where your parts coming from and down to a very, very granular level. And the car auto manufacturer have to roll all of that information up to, to, to their MSRP next to their MSRP label. Yes. So that is, the, that is the carrot. But the stick, the stick is you have just a couple of weeks ago, I think Sweden or Denmark, one of these Scandinavian and Norwegian countries, that are placing penalties. And carbon credits well talked about, but hasn't been really been unified or implemented. I think it's only been a matter of time in the next couple of years where you, if, you're, if your nutritional table has excessive carbon than what you're allowed, you either have to source alternative, um, alternative source, you know, field alternative sources to lower your carbon credit, or you have to buy people with carbon credit. So yes. I can imagine like somebody like in Brazil that has Amazons, that produce, you know, that eat carbon. So they have carbon credit. You have to buy the carbon credit from them. From them, yes. Or you have to resort to pay penal credit, carbon penalties. So this is not just something that you feel good and sounds good. Yes. Um, that anybody who to buy nickel laterite, uh, nickel from nickel laterite, you are, you're vulnerable and open yourself to paying, you know, these nickel carbon credits up to the wazoo. And yes. And that's why you also, Andrew, see some companies like the Japanese, they're really playing catch up. Uh, you have a big Japanese like Mitsui, what's the largest uh, um, st st uh, stainless steel producers, iron ore uh, intakers that did a deal with uh, Nickel Jr. And then last week you have Mitsubishi, that's one of the largest nickel consumers in Japan, electronics and, and, and steel producing. They just signed another deal with another Nickel Jr. in Canada, the BC. And you have, and and uh, I think that the Japanese are a bit late to the game as opposed to Tesla and the Koreans, but yeah. they're pretty touch up because they realize, and they're staying away. They severed, severed their uh, uh, Philippine and Indonesia uh, joint venture with Vale. I'm talking about the Japanese Sumitomo. Yeah. And then they're they're now shifting strategy and understanding the major difference on nickel production from laterite versus sulfide, not just on the unit production cost. But the the big elephant that's going to come down, and yes. that is carbon credits. Yeah, because you could think, I mean, it's kind of like if, if you're trying to hedge and you're using the futures markets, this is a hedge on policy where I agree with you. Without a doubt, this is this is happening. It's coming, it's coming, and it's coming at a, at a fast pace. So if you're exactly. if you're a battery maker, if even if you're Ford, if you're it doesn't matter, whatever car company, you're thinking, okay, I could source it for maybe a year or two from somewhere. Maybe I take a penalty, but I really, if I'm looking long term, this is happening, and they're probably starting to scramble. Go, do we have mining advisors on our team? Yeah. <laughs> you know, do we have investment bankers specialized on finding us projects? Uh, and that's what's kind of exciting for this sector now is we're finally seeing the acknowledgement in the news. Uh, they made a big deal with the German Chancellor coming, and the acknowledgement there. Uh, yes. you know, they gave a good nod towards the, the battery energy metals, and we're starting to see people come around. And once again, it's moving away from just the lithium story, which I, it was great. It built up that in people's minds how to make these things. But now it's all right. What else is there? And nickel is so key uh, for this uh, at this stage. And that uh, and we we're, we're blessed in Canada, but it's your specific project, too, that is compelling because it fits the other part of the narrative, which, as you're saying, it's it's happening, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, Andrew, uh... A couple of good data points. First, Australians don't typically approach approach uh, on shore in Canada. And then you have Wailu that's been in war with BHP over a small project that, well, not a small, but over a project that requires billions of dollars in capital infrastructures development and nobody really care for it in Canada. And all of a sudden you have two uh, Australian giant before Noron that went from 50 cents back to over two, I think a dollar fifty or something like fifty million dollar ended up the price tag of two hundred fifty million dollars. And now Australia uh, BHP it was came out empty handed and turned around within three months and bid five billion dollar for Oz Minerals. 
So, and, and that gives you a little bit of an idea. And these projects, you know, it requires billion dollars in several years out um, yeah. to, to see the metals out of the ground. And, and you clearly see that these guys have the foresight because they see the buy side and sell side, um, but of insider in, into the future of nickel. And, um, uh, and the secondly, another insight is we have been approached, we're talking to about 10 strategic right now. We're just a bit overwhelmed. We had a very successful, successful site visit. Uh, we filled the seats of this prop, you know, a little prop um, propeller place to yeah. you know, go in. And the first conversation I had with this major world top ranking battery and, 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 and auto manufacturers were, hey, the first five minutes I say, let's cut to the chase, okay? I, I, don't, I, don't, I want to make sure the conversation is productive, but the earliest Minago can turn nickel out of the ground is 2026. Yes, so three were, years away, yeah. Andrew, too much of my surprise. They were relieved. They're like, oh my God, I'm, I, how come I didn't know you about guys? Well, that's because we just went public six months ago in March. Yeah. Everybody they talked to, are looking at the window of, of 2029 to 2032. Yeah. So I'm thinking that, whoa, you know, I think they're probably exhausted talking to the traffic auras and ballets and and and, and Glencores and, and you know struck at that end and they have to go and talk to juniors that can barely satisfy a quarter of their current uh, production output just to show how tight um yes. that, uh, the nickel market is and how much nickel demand is going forward and have these guys looking at so far out. And last but not least, you know, after you talk about the Aussies going up ashore on Canada hunting for assets and you talk about you talk about auto manufacturer, battery manufacturer approaching little juniors like ours and are years away from production. And then third, I think this all of this fundamentals and data points have validated the bullish case for nickel is validated by the price action of nickel in March. When the price of nickel went from ten dollars to fifty dollars a pound. Now, yes, I have, I have been in the mining industry of metals, invested for twenty years, and I was early on the nickel theme. I started buying nickel projects in twenty ten. I was ten years old already, and unfortunately, I did that fast. These assets, you know, I bought other projects in Manitoba, in Yukon, in Ontario. So, you know, I was the nickel guy for early part of twenty ten, um, and never like. Uh, I lost my train of thought a little bit, but the, the point is, you know, this, this, the, 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 the even the, the twenty-year veteran, nobody has ever seen the action, the ferociousness of, of yes. nickel up then, and the volatility, how fast it went, and just a bit of data points, Andrew, quick for your audience, uh, 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 sort of a uh, audience, and uh, um, uh, for for your sake of audiences, London Metals Exchange, which trades nickel, is owned by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Hong Kong is stock exchange is tightly linked to the Chinese government. And yeah. the biggest nickel laterite producer, nickel trader in China is linked to the Chinese government. And they yeah. he was massively short of nickel. Because nickel has traded the span between five to ten dollars a pound for more than a decade. So everybody know how to make money. When it's five, he buy. When it's ten, yeah. he sell. He's done that and made a lot of money. So when the nickel broke out of ten dollars six months ago, he kept adding and doubling up his <laughs> yeah. and it was a multi-billion dollar loss and had to call his boss to halt the trading on the MLE for two weeks. And even after the trade resumed, there's a lot of restrictions. You cannot, there's limits, down limit, you cannot short, you cannot sell, there's a lot of positional limits and the price limits. And even to, and then they even allow you to roll over your position without squaring the position. Yes. So I do. I mean, that is all these things are absolutely unprecedented. It costs a billion dollar lawsuit right now in the nickel volume, trading volume in the ALME is a shadow of its former self. It's trading around 40,000 contracts. They used to be averaging 150,000 contracts. So, where we look at right now is I was talking to another YouTuber is if you're looking to invest in nickel, there's not a better time. We can discuss about the nickel mining company. And yeah. of course, you know, I will, I will do that. But, you rather pay a little bit more on nickel right now, which is trading at ten dollars a pound, to be resting on the resistance level, having broken yeah. out a huge yes. banner convicted. It's not even questionable. The bull market is on. Yeah. Elon Musk said in 2018, minus as much as possible. Then to buy nickel at 950 below that resistance. Because you could be waiting as a lot of guys done in the last 10 years. There's yeah. really not a better time and a place to get into nickel and nickel mining. Isn't questioning the, one of the better way because you cannot nickel metals difficult to find and even 
even if you want to get an American nickel, American nickel money is not made out of nickel anymore. No, uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Price, a dime, the nickel content in that, in that, in that, in that, in that nickel is more than the nickel itself. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's funny just to go back to like, because you would have, I mean, you were ahead of the curve whenever you were looking at these nickel projects. But I would even argue that that would like, that's so sound because we should have been as a, as a country in like 2014, 2015, really been hitting hard with the government, letting people know, let's get on board this resource train. We're doing this shift. We need to get people mobilized and get this. It's a long process. They're developing minds. And it's frustrating because it's like, why didn't we do this sooner? And now it's all, all of a sudden, it's starting to pick up now. Like, well, how fast can we do it? And you go, well, this, this isn't tech. This isn't something where you just, or, or even an oil and gas field where you can kind of turn it on. Mining is a lot, it's a, it's a lengthy process, uh, but at least it's happening now. I mean, if there's anything, so for some to go, you've done a lot of work. There's a ton of, uh, you know, value stored up in flying nickel and, you know, it, it can't be understated. The fact that it's high grade open pit, there's infrastructure. I mean, we, it hits all those check boxes. And then of course, uh, you've got that ESG component, which once again, whether people like it or not, I mean, it's a very hot it's political topic. It is a hundred percent coming fast. Um, and every businessman has to know, uh, or businesswoman, that where they're sourcing things, uh, they might get away with it for the next year or the next two years. But after that, it's starting to get very tough out there. And you know what, Andrew? I love to talk about Minago for hours. But <laughs> yeah. It was overly promotional. So I like to sort of resort back to the macro thing about it. It's better yes. late than never in Canada because you guys are so wilding down. You're like, why do I care about battery or solar? Or 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 wind because when I have all the hydro there is the, like you know I can power hydro powers enough to power three times over my yeah. current population so it's understandable first of all um, Barrick if you look at Barrick CEO he actually I think about four months three months ago he came on the he came on the Bloomberg or whatnot and say that we view Canada as a strategic location we got to invest more in Canada. I think part of that is, as I mentioned really earlier, about the nutritional table. There yeah. are, if you want subsidies, if you want to have that sort of, you know, the new uh, American alliance with Mexico, with Trump would assign a new name to it. Um, you gotta, the source of origin is critical in, in securing your, I think the world's getting more divided and, and, and localized. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you yeah. Gotta do that. Um, and uh, our experience in dealing with, and you know, we like Canada a lot. Uh, we also have to sort of uh, attribute to, uh, send tribute to our uh, our partner in Minago, which is a Norway house. Yeah. These uh, First Nation people, they're very well educated. They're very entrepreneurial. They are very, uh, they're very clear in their stance. And I think they've been very, very fair and equitable in their discussions with us. So we have a very cordial relationship. In fact, I'm going up to Minago on Monday. That's why we're having this Sunday special uh, ahead. And maybe we can deliver some news after my meetings of the First Nation to share with the audience, which yes. makes the meeting even more timely, is that we found there all the key ingredients are Canada in making this as a strategic destination for future investments, a very attractive location. Versus I think the United States is going through a bit of a pain in transition or in, in, in putting themselves out in identifying themselves as a pro or anti-mining. And so in, I think that the, the, the wind is really, you know, the tide is turning towards Canada is a very favorable uh, investment jurisdiction. So yeah, we I'm love Canada. You. We love working in Canada. We love working in Manitoba. We have a we have been working very uh, closely with the Manitoba government as well the men who, uh, and as well as the First Nations group, which is found them to be very very pleasant to deal with. And the pace of which we're progressing this project is actually faster than when we met, we have anticipated. Even though we haven't had a lot of news coming, but you're gonna see some very hopefully pleasant surprises coming before the end of the year. I'm glad you brought that up too, because uh, not only for Canadians, because even Canadians don't are they're not aware of how important mining is. But when they see that you've got First Nations that are business partners in the deal, it isn't just you've made some sort of side thing. It's their business partners in this. They fully understand uh, a lot of these these bands and uh, leaders. They under they see the shift and 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 the opportunity, the possibilities it'll bring to their community. And for someone who's foreign, who looks and sees this, once again, as a social aspect, they go, this is a, a fair partner in it. They're driving this forward as well. And it hits that box of ESG as well. You know what, again, Andrew, it's not just about feeling good, right? Yeah. I mean, Canada, Canadian, 
I mean, I have some business, of course, I have some personal business in Canada in, in real estate. And, and uh, you remember 10 years ago when oil was at 100 mm -hmm. and Canadian dollar was at 20, at the premium, $1.25. Yeah. Uh, US dollar to loony. So, you know, now we're, we're facing $100 oil and where's the loony at? Yeah. Um, I think great, gradually, Canadians, I am not pro fossil. But I'm yeah. just saying that natural resources is a great hedge to the economy and to job creation and to inflation. Yes. So, and I think that's oil is a perfect example. I, I'm not saying that nickel, you know, you mine a nickel mine in Canada is going to have the same magnitude of, or, or scale of effect. But collectively as a whole, you have nickel, lithium, copper mines, and zinc mines, and natural gas, which is a clean form of energy. Yeah. My God, if you look at Alberta and BC, they have trillions of TCS of natural gas. I think it's time yes. that we, well, <laughs> I think it's worth a, 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 a look for Canadians to look into tapping into their natural resources in yes. an environmentally responsible, socially responsible way. And that is that is just not something to feel good. There's a trade off, of course. Once you dig in mind, you're not going to look the same way as it was. Yeah. But they're very tangible uh, economic benefits to uh, to the country as a whole to to uh, to hedge against this highly volatile and uh, and, um, and and uncertain world right now. Yeah, and to meet the challenges too. I mean, people kind of they'll think of the the, the one-off stories of mining or ones from 30, 40 years ago. Mining is very different. Oh my god! Done, especially if you've got you've got access to capital, you've got you know people on side, and also you've got the firm regulations where. Like I always say, you want, you, there's no longer being NIMBY, like not in my backyard. You want it in your backyard so that you can keep an eye on it and you have a say in it. And I think that's when people feel like, oh, we're doing this properly. And there's a chance now for the mining industry, especially to shine, to go, we can do all these projects. We can do it and we can show you that we can do it. And that can lead Canada forward in a, in a big way. On the ESG, Andrew, I've been in the mining industry for 20 years. First 10 years as an investor and the second 10 years as a mining company. Started off as a hobby that turned into a full time job. So, I'm interested in running mining companies, how it works. Now, I know more than I need to know about exploration, engineering, feasibility study, and ESG. In today's environment, Andrew, it is impossible versus just a few years ago to build a mine without adhering to the law. What's it called? The law of three the law of the rule of law, the rule of logic, and the rule of relationship. So what I mean by that, if you don't have the local community and the province and the state on your side, that, that's the rule of logic and rule of relationship. If you're digging a hole in somebody else's backyard, it is impossible to build the mine. You cannot just rely on the rule of law. Nobody, no, no, no provincial and federal government is going to sign off on your permit without community consultation. And you, and if you like in South America or anywhere in the world now, if the neighbors have a problem with your project. If you're not being transparent in what you're doing in the community, they will block your road and the cops are not going to show up. Okay. Yeah. They're going to resort to your dealing with, uh, you, you're working those issues, resolve them amicably. And if the, uh, if the issues be escalated, the environmental conservationists, they have, they can tap into hundreds of, you know, billions of dollars plus yeah. of aid and legal available. I mean, look at cases in Honduras, look at cases in Mexico. Yeah. Um, so it used to be the case is very one sided because, you know, the mining companies betrayed us once they were in bed with the government with, you know, by, 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 you know, by it's, it's maybe 10 years ago, but certainly it's not the case. Push come the shove um, that the, uh, the government is going to side with the local communities. Yes. So have changed almost drastically in the last 10 years um, that uh, I think, I think that to be, setting cases 20 or 30 years ago of of some of something you know where the government where the mining company got a free pass it's it's, it's old news it's a long distant past yes and, that, and that's good for people to realize and that's why you know even for myself is trying to get that news out to the average person to say listen uh it's not like the stories you see it's easy pickings in the media sometimes just kind of bash on this and that but it's not i mean we know that we're facing this uh this big change and the answer has come from mining and we can do it in a very responsible way. And uh, and that's what's so exciting with the nickel project. But I want to kind of talk a little bit as we're wrapping yes. up here about the vanadium as well, because I mean, I love vanadium. Uh, I was a big fan of it. You know, I started getting into it about five years ago, but maybe a little bit ahead of the curve there as well myself. But why don't you tell us 
kind of the macro look and, and where this is going with the, the, a little bit with the Redox batteries as well, and then the project itself. Yeah, so I like to talk a minute about Vanadium and then go back to the minute talk about Minago, which is really my passion. Yes. The company signed a letter of agreement that's non-binding stage to acquire the Vanadium project in Nevada. And vanadium is used in the Redox flow battery, and these are mature technology invented by NASA about 20 years ago. Um, and these are batteries that can last for 20 years because the anode and the cathode both are vanadium. This is one of the metals that Robert Freely invested tens of millions of dollars, called it the miracle metal. So these, these batteries can go 20 years without degradation, full charge and discharge, and typically the size up to 100 megawatts or even more. And they're used to complement renewable energies like solar and wind. So the wind don't shine or the solar, the wind, wind don't blow and sun don't shine. Then, then the battery can then um, be discharged and supply the grid energy. Uh, we're, the Flatnico is looking at this project because I think it's twofold. It's looking at consolidating and gaining a bit of critical mass and liquidity to ride out the storm and current nickel per, uh, correction, the metals correction. While on the upside, it's, it's riding on the two metals on the upside, both the need yep. and the nickel. So that's really the rationale, but I think, you know, Andrew, I'd like to defer that discussion maybe until the transaction is completed in about three for months. For sure. Time. But let's go back to nickel for a bit. Yes. Uh, as I said, I'm a nickel bull. I looked at the, I'm a, one of the few, very few nickel has, very few nickel CEOs that, well, junior mining CEOs can say that has done more nickel deals than I have. <laughs> um, and, uh, but my, my the, the one project I loved the most, 2000, when I started the nickel on, on the buy, on the, on the, on the mining business side as a, running as a company, Minago was my number one project. Yeah. So it was very fortunate. I waited for 10 years or well, 12 years, better late than never, to actually acquire this project. We outbid it, everybody. I front run Red Cloud, which is the one that did the, uh, that coordinated the divestor process from previous vendor, which went, which went, uh, debt was calling. So they own like $20 million of debt. And I just say, what the price tag is, I, without a, a penny of a haggle, and I just pulled just the plug it. and bought the project for 20 million. Yeah. The reason is, Andrew, Minago is, is one of the highest grade nickel project, open pit optimized nickel sulfide in Canada, bar none. Yes. The current nickel sulfide open pit mine grades in the world, not just in Canada, is 0.4%. Okay. And that was halved from just 15 years ago in 2005, which means in 2005, the average grade was 0.8%. So if you have a 0.4% nickel project, that's like powder you could get for like a million dollars but now the average uh, nickel sulfide mining grades in the world is 0.4 and minago right now is 0.74 and yes the funny thing is according to AM, ame research which is well established mining research firm seven years of history they predict the forecast that the grades will drop by half again to 0.2 wow. by 2030 and the reason is there has not been a new sulfide discovery and if they were there hasn't that that um that uh, it's going to take so many years to get the mine into production, and it's, and then Andrew, if you look at some of our peers, and, and, and not to not to sort of <laughs> in like Canada nickel, um, uh, Giga metal, they're like 0 0.25, 0 0.22. So I think they're they have a lot of credence into their research. So the reason I said I like Minago is even truer today than it was when I looked at it in two thousand and nine. Was it's great? It's open pit zero point seven four. It's unparalleled. Yes. Outside of Nora, which is acquired by Wailu, but Nora requires multi-billion dollars of, of, of power, road, they're, they're middle of nowhere, like 500, 500 kilometers need a hydro line. Yes. We are one and a half kilometer from the road it's and huge. from a hydro line. Our yes. capex is several billion dollars, of which, like, again, in today's nickel projects in Canada, it's unheard of. So it's really the, the, the combination of the gray, which were three times higher than our peers, and that we don't require any infrastructure development. Yes. And third, but not least, is that make the Minago even more attractive today than it was 12 years ago when I looked at it is $40 million we spent on it. The project was fully permitted when we bought the project in 2021 for $20 million. I didn't know, we didn't know about it because the company was, you know, it's on the verge of going belly up. And then we approached the Manitoba government and they were, they said, oh, your license is good. You just need to, um, um, complete a minor notice of alteration of which we completed that paperwork and we submitted is under adjudication. And we're hearing some um, positive, we, we, we cannot affirm at this time, but we think the news could be imminent one way or the other. 
So not only do we have one of the highest grade, arguably the highest grade nickel project, uh, open pitable control by a junior, we have very low infrastructure cost. We potentially could be the lowest carbon footprint emission, carbon emission in the world as a nickel mine because we're 99% hydropower. And we could be shovel ready by the end of this year. Yeah. And yet, you know what? The best of all is the company trading at 15 million market cap. Yes. And that is lower, almost half. Well, two weeks ago, it was 13 cents, 10 million, sub 10 million. It's half of what we paid for. And that's before the nickel run up. It's one sixth of the total investment that I found into this project. That yes. included 85,000 meters of drilling. That's going to cost $40 million to replicate today. Yeah. Uh, environmental studies are going to take you four to five years because a lot of that's seasonal. Yep. And the feasibility study, hope, which we're updating, we're going to release that by the end of the year. Excellent. All of yes. this combination combined put, I think, mean, you know, a very unique, strategic, and valuable place. And that's only going to grow over time, the attractiveness, because you're seeing that declining nickel grades over time. And this, Andrew, we saw went, went over the bang at $1.40 in March. Who knew, right? In hindsight, it was the climax of the market. Yeah. But, I mean, that created, unfortunately, a bit of, 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 of vacuum from buying. Everybody exhausted their buying. And that's why we went down probably heavier, down more than everybody else. We're trading like a tenth of what we did uh, six months ago. But yeah. this, Andrew, is not crypto. Okay? There is, no, this is real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is, we're talking to 10 strategic right now. We're laying, delivering our assets. I think it's going to come in the next four to six weeks. Okay, there's good. Yes. News and there's that feasibility study. We're going to be one of the very few rare unicorns out there that by the end of the year, we're going to have a project shovel ready with a feasibility study and, um, and um, with some good, interesting asset results to come. And that's why I was so glad to talk to you because it's for mining. It's so short term, and I'm, and you look at the scrambling that's going on. And we've mentioned Elon Musk. We, I've seen messages from Ford. You name it, whatever car company, every battery maker out there, uh, they need to start sourcing, and they're they're under the gun, and they're trying to catch up to speed with all the rules that are coming down as well. And this does check everyone off. And I've said it before: is that you know, if someone's too distracted with all the bad news out there, and there's there's plenty of bad news, there's lots of changes, lots of chaos, and we've seen that in the market, everything's pulled back. But at the same time, if someone can really hone in and really concentrate and go, okay, well, what are these, like these unicorns, these real outstanding projects that real fit the narrative? The next strategy. Yes. And you know what, unfortunately, I've been around for 20 years, it never ceases to amaze me, you know, you know, nickel went to fifty dollars and fly nickel trading. I thought when we acquired the project, the stock doesn't go fly. Well, fly in the opposite direction, at least for now. Is that one one never ceases to amaze me is one of the industries that required the longest patience, unfortunately, has <laughs> investors that were the shortest views. That's yeah. kind of just the way it is. Uh, first of all, and secondly, with all the mining issuers, good and bad and ugly. They're all babies thrown into the water. Now, it's a, and I think around, I've invested over 200 mining juniors. I've toured around the world for 35 projects uh, doing side visits. I've done more than 15 M&As. You know, the companies that I managed and created, some of us trade the highest volume trading in on the TSS Ventures and with some of the most prominent investors like Eric Sprite invested in the company and, and uh, raised over $150 million. Now is the time to reevaluate your portfolio. I've over, you know, sold and sold 200 mining equity positions. And looking into the guys that has an extra strategy, has longevity, has a way yes. to get to the finishing line. Ditch these guys are exploration drill hole place. You know, waiting for, holding onto that. Say, look, predicting the metal future metal price is already tough enough of a challenge. And along with the metallurgy and all that, you don't need at this point, given the value of some of the like fly nickel. And there are, there are dozens of others. You don't need to be banking on those exploration risks right now. You have some really real stories out there that are being punished because of the short term. Um, you know, just 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 the trading of, of traders getting in and all their positions, covering their whatever margin calls. But now it really is the time to look at your portfolio and banking on stuff that has uh, real tangible metals in the ground. Andrew. Yeah. And like I said, you've hit all the, the check boxes. And I mean, I've, I'm the same way. I encourage people to talk to your advisor, look at your portfolio and see where do I have the potential to make asymmetric gains that uh, is following this entire narrative of this shift in energy. 
And this, these kind of projects that have all of these highlights with this kind of stored in value, uh, they're going to stand out. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, ones that are a little bit further away or further out uh, won't be thrust forward as much as something like this, which is really, it's pretty impressive the amount of stored up value you've got within this company uh, I, I ready to go. I am banking on my 20 years experience in the, in the mining business, especially, especially in a second nickel, that you're not going to find a project as unique, as high grade, in as better location, second largest nickel can in the world than Thompson Nickel Belt. And in the stage of the project will be shovel ready by year. You're not going to find another Amazing. Nickel yep. or any mining project in North America, in Canada, that has a parallel to us. Andrew, let me conclude that uh, it's absolutely interesting conversation going on for a minute long is let me share another insight with you of what I think Nico is going to uh, reestablish this track back to its <laughs> former glory, which is only six months ago. Elon Musk is one smart man because he knew to, he knew the difference. And I'm sure for your silver audience will know the subject very well. He knew the difference between paper nickel and the physical nickel. So he went on, he didn't talk to a, a, a paper trader, right? He went directly to Valet, which is the largest nickel miner in the world. He didn't go to some other intermediaries, right? Or he didn't just, he wasn't just satisfied getting a, a battery contract from Panasonic or LG. He's not making his own batteries. Yeah. He was satisfied. He's like, okay, you know, it's battery guys business to come out with a nickel for their battery because I signed a contract, right? Because you know the critical importance that if battery, if nickel doesn't show up, the batteries don't show up. If the battery don't show up, a billion, the hundreds of billion dollar valuation wipe off his balance sheet. So yeah. he understood the importance of that. So, but the problem is if you look at the news recently from GM, because I was asked to come on that exact same subject, and it took me a while to kind of like so I can give you, you know, cut to the chase of the answers. These guys, these auto manufacturers and battery manufacturers, they are right now thinking, oh, you know what? I've got myself covered. Don't worry about it. They're going to these intermediaries like the Glam Course and Traffic Boras and lesser traders. They are, let me state very, uh, let me state very unequivocally, so in case they're listening, okay. they are right now buying paper nickel. Okay. Yeah. They're buying paper nickel thinking that they have the goods when they don't. And these paper nickel are double counting, triple counting, and allocated. Also, Oof. the shenanigans is happening. We know that from silver. We know the copper contract in Shanghai that's missing copper because they're yep. double counting. Somewhere it's a physical delivery. When push comes to the shove, whoever, it doesn't really matter who, either it's a battery guy or a trader guy that try to enforce their contract to get their nickel when the nickel's not there, or whoever that's supposed to be short in the stick and not come over the nickel, there's only one solution. They will go to the Linden Metals Exchange. Now, yep. the problem with the Linden Metals Exchange is the metal is in the warehouse is around 30, 50,000 tons. That's not even enough for a quarter of Tesla's production. Only yes. Not even half or a quarter of one auto manufacturer. And then you're talking about Volkswagen, Ford, GN. They're all paper contract. What happened then? Okay, so the guys are like, holy shit, I need to deliver this nickel, whoever the end guy is to this battery guy or to about to, to Tesla, which Tesla is just gonna give it to the battery manufacturer. They're gonna go to the LME. And when they go to the LME, you're gonna see a hell of storm break loose. <laughs> because there is not enough nickel there and they're gonna be shooting their side of the foot. Unfortunately also, it's kind of like a, a palladium replay when the Volkswagen had the scandal with the, with the yep. diesel emission of people facing out of diesel cars, which is a platinum catalyst, they have to buy Gasoline power car, which is palladium. Palladium went from 800 to 2300, 2800 in about a year and a half, in about six months to a year in 2018. They raided the ETF, they raided the palladium ETF, they emptied mm -hmm. out the palladium. Unfortunately, Andrew, there is no nickel ETF, there is no nickel inventory, there's no nickel stockpile. You're when that moment were to happen, you're gonna see major fireworks, and that. <laughs> door of even yes. what you saw there in March. I don't know when, but I think from here, the downside for nickel is a lot. You're, it's a major decade long resistance trading at $10. You, you'd rather be buying right now at 11 or 10 than, we, than you were buying at 9 or 9.50 before that major breakout. So I cannot think of a better time and a place to get in nickel technically and fundamentally. I think one of these, one of these auto manufacturers is going to see that epiphany and waking moment when, they, when their paper contract is no good. 
And then, then, uh, and then, and then, if you're into nickel, you cannot buy nickel right now in the LME. It's a member exclusive. It's not like I can only have the traders comment me as for delivery. Yeah. Now you have to get in the nickel uh, mining companies, and I have to say that fly nickel. I mean, I, it is my number one pick, and I am very big position on uh, on the fly. I bought half a million shares at sixty cents and haven't sold a single share. Perfect. And if you want that asymmetric gain, like you said, you're and it's physically. It's in the it's a vault in the ground right now because you already have a, a, like a, a resource and you're with got the a license print. with the license yeah. print soon. <laughs> yes, and we're gonna yeah, and news is coming out pretty soon. So I really thank you, John, for spending the time. Uh, like I said, th it's it's very rare that we have a project that has so many check boxes uh, of all of the key themes that we talk about. So it was a real pleasure, uh, guys. Nickel, take a look at flying nickel. Thanks so look much, John up. Lee. Look us up at uh, flynickel.com, and I'm very active in Twitter. I tweet daily on the market. I'm a charter financial analyst. It's a uh, John Lee Battery Metals. And given we're discussing with 10 Strategic, as soon as we publish the feasibility study and the project shovel ready with the environment permit, you're going to see that pace accelerate. I, I am not sure where the nickel price is going to end up, but it's anywhere sort of, you know, let's see if, if, if the nick, fly nickel maybe are still an ongoing concern two years from now. Let's see what, what let's see those <laughs> wings. Let's see those wings start going. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks again. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for your time, Andrew. Talk again soon.